Linda Gilroy. Mr Deputy Speaker, in rising to make my first speech, I would like to say something of my constituency. It is particularly relevant that I should make my maiden speech in the annual debate on defence, coming as I do from one of the leading defence constituencies in the country, Plymouth Sutton. Yeah. Called Sutton in the Doomsday Book, Plymouth's original harbour is still called Sutton Harbour. A developing trade and the shipment of armies to France led to its early growth and by the 16th century it was flourishing and the home port to many Elizabethan adventurers, including Sir Walter Raleigh, who set off for Virginia from Plymouth, and Sir Francis Drake, who sailed with the English fleet from Plymouth to defend the country against attack from the Spanish Armada in 1588. Sutton Harbour is now flourishing on a different basis as the home to the fastest growing fish market in Europe. The hoe on its southern waterfront is dominated by the Citadel, built by Charles II and now home to the 29th Commander Regiment Royal Artillery. The east of my constituency is bounded by the Royal Dockyard, which was started in the late 17th century and became the focus for the town of Plymouth Dock, named Devonport, in 1824. As a naval port, Plymouth has played a key role in the defence of the country. And partly as a result of this, during World War II, the city suffered severe bomb damage from air raids. Indeed, it was the most bombed city in England. At the entrance to Sutton Harbour, the walls carry plaques recording the historic voyages which started from Plymouth. They also include many to those who died at sea while fishing or working in the merchant service. Perhaps the most famous amongst the voyages are the Mayflower Pilgrims, who finally set sail from Plymouth in 1620 for the New World. The plaque recording the Pilgrim Fathers was put up in 1955, but it was only in the early 1980s that the names of the Pilgrim Mothers, essential, I would think, to the New World, were added. My right honourable friend referred in his opening remarks to the potential huge movements of people uh, in Europe. And some of the plaques at Sutton Harbour mark the departure of some 450,000 people to Australia and New Zealand in the 18th and 19th centuries. I was fortunate enough to visit Australia during the recess as a member of our Commonwealth Parliamentary Association delegation, and we were able to see firsthand the impact which emigrants from the South West made in establishing the roots of what is now a flourishing country. The links with Tasmania, as shown in place names, are particularly strong. Devonport, Exeter, Launceston, Staverton, Tamar and Cornwall, to name but a few. Yeah. We visited the Australian National War Memorial in Canberra, which reminded us of the strong defence links with our Commonwealth allies. Yeah, yeah. I would like to take this opportunity of putting on record my thanks to the many Australian members of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association the staff of the various parliaments in New South Wales, in Canberra and in Tasmania, and our own High Commission staff. They all contributed to making our visit purposeful and memorable. The historic landings at Plymouth are less well recorded, with one notable exception. In 1956, Plymouth trade unionists put a plaque on the harbour wall to mark the homecoming of four of the Twilpuddle martyrs who landed back in Plymouth in March 1838, having survived their exile in Australia. Our waterfront has rich historic associations, which have earned the city the titles of Cradle of the Commonwealth and Springboard for the New World. There are indeed some 40 places in the world which take their name from Plymouth. We are working to celebrate that millennial heritage in the regeneration of our waterfront. The Shell Guide to Britain refers to our waterfront as one of the premier waterfronts in the world. The Mayflower Steps, on the other hand, marking the, where the pilgrims left from, have been called the most underdeveloped heritage site in this country. So we have much to do and I hope to play a leading part in ensuring the citizens and visitors of the next millennium know about the role the City of Plymouth played in defence and in worldwide terms during this millennium. Many famous men have been associated with Plymouth, explorers, adventurers, discoverers and scientists. Plymouth has also had some remarkable, courageous and dedicated women. 
They include several scientists, nurses and doctors. Dr Mary Park made her contribution in the 1940s to marine science, working in Plymouth's Marine Biological Association as a forerunner of our world-famous Plymouth Marine Laboratory, which now employs 200 people in my constituency. Plymouth's medical women played a significant role in the services. Eight of them, trained under pioneer nurse Priscilla Sellen, worked with Florence Nightingale in the Crimea, and pioneer woman surgeon Dr Mabel Ramsey worked on the battlefields in the First World War. I welcome the announcement made by my right honourable friend to extend the scope for women to be involved in our armed forces, as will many of my constituents, female constituents, who serve in them. Equally, Plymouth has a unique record in the representation of women in Parliament. There are many pictures in the corridors of this House which feature Lady Astor and mark her role as the first woman to take her seat in 1919, representing the constituency of Plymouth Sutton. Her maiden speech was made in a debate on one of her favourite campaigning issues, which she referred to as the vexed question of drink. I think she would have approved of the steps announced before the recess to control the sale of Alcapops. She stood up for equal rights for women in the civil service, and I suspect she would have been the first to castigate the former Minister for the Armed Forces and the present Secretary of State for their somewhat lukewarm remarks commenting on my right honourable friend's decisions about the scope for women in the armed forces. She wanted to raise the school leaving age to 16 to reduce unemployment, and she made clear her annoyance at the lack of interest shown in social reform. Indeed, I feel she would feel much at home with much of our programme as set out by New Labour as we move to raise standards in education and to recognise the essential links which this has with sustaining employment in today's world. But I think she would also have been angry to know that the constituency at the end of the 20th century on the index of local conditions includes St Peter's as the poorest ward in England. Yeah. Lady Nancy Astor was the first of an almost unbroken succession of women politicians to represent the city of Plymouth, something which must be unique to our city. In the Labour landslide election of 1945, Lucy Middleton was elected the first Labour woman to represent the seat of Plymouth Sutton. In the aftermath of war, international cooperation and the role of food aid in achieving this was the subject of her maiden speech. In 1955, Dame Joan Vickers was elected to the neighbouring seat of Plymouth Devonport and was the first woman to represent a dockyard constituency. Dame Joan lost her seat in 1974, the same year as a former Deputy Speaker, Dame Janet Fuchs, now Baroness Fuchs, became the member of Plymouth Drake, which she represented until this year. The new Plymouth Sutton is the successor seat to Plymouth Drake. Baroness Fuchs campaigned successfully for an act to stop curb crawling in 1995 and concluded her long service in Parliament as, in this House as Deputy Speaker commanding the respect of members of both sides of the House. As the fifth woman representing the city and following such a distinguished line of women members, I am proud to be the city's first Labour and cooperative member of Parliament. I will be active in seeking cooperative solutions to the many challenges which face us locally and nationally, working alongside my 24 Labour and cooperative colleagues on this side of the House. I'm also mindful that there is still much to be done to secure the proper representation of women in this House. There still have been not many more than 200 women members since Lady Astor took her seat in 1919. In the same time, there have been over 4,000 male members of Parliament. I look forward to working with all members of this House particularly the 117 other women, to sustain the momentum we have achieved at this election. Mr Deputy Speaker, despite recent reductions, the levels of unemployment in the City of Plymouth continue to be alarmingly high. We have suffered from the decline of employment of our traditional industry in the dockyard. Indeed, it has been nearly decimated. The emphasis given by the Government to equipping people for work through its New Deal programme is welcome as are measures on educational standards to help our citizens compete in the global economy. 
I shall work hard along with my colleagues on the City Council in the partnerships they have forged with people in business and in the community to ensure that we respond enthusiastically to those measures. But with 11 people unemployed for every job vacancy in Plymouth in recent times, something must be done to ensure the jobs market improves. There has been much anger at the destruction of key parts of our defence, particularly naval industrial base. Skilled teams of workers have been cast wantonly to the inefficient vagaries of the unfettered free market. The country <coughs> invested time, skill and money in training people who are now underusing their skills or not able to use them at all. It is nearly 30 years now since the United Nations identified over 40 ways in which military engineering and technological skills could be used for civilian industrial research and development, particularly in one of the world's future growth industries, environmental technology. At long last, we are taking this seriously and we are looking forward to a major conference on defence diversification in Bristol next week. I also warmly welcome the announcement that a green paper on our plans for defence diversification, as promised in our manifesto, will be published this autumn. We must fight for opportunities to maximise these valuable industrial skills and knowledge, and I hope we will pay particular attention to the role which green technology can play in this di diversification process. Mr Deputy Speaker, Although we need to diversify our economy, the defence industry will remain a central part of our economy. At long last, we have a strategic defence review based on the foreign policy needs of our country. The outcome of that review must ensure that we have the right sea, air and land capabilities to defend our economic and trading interests, as well as capabilities which enable us to be an effective ally with our partners in the global arena. Our defence capabilities and peacekeeping capabilities require the utmost in skills and discipline. They are something which our country can and should take great pride in. The City of Plymouth certainly does, and our contribution to this is still significant, despite the cuts which I referred to earlier. From the 29th Commander Regiment Royal Artillery at the Citadel to the 3 Commander Brigade Royal Marines in Stonehouse Barracks, from the MOD workers who work in support of the Navy and the dockyard workers who work at Devonport Royal Dockyard, from British aerospace workers to the men and women of the Territorial Army based at Mill Bay who serve under the 4th Battalion Devonshire and Dorset Regiment. In the South West region, of which we like to think of Plymouth as being the capital, some 16,000 men and women earn their living and spend their working lives in the service of us all. They deserve a review which acknowledges the importance of the vital role they play. I want to conclude my remarks by stressing the importance to Plymouth of the Royal Naval Dockyard. Despite its virtual decimation, it is an industry which the workers and the city still take great pride in. Over and over again, DML and their workers have been able to report completion of work ahead of schedule. Within recent months, the efficiency of the docking and essential defects programme on the Type 23 frigate HMS Montrose resulted in it, in it being undocked four days ahead of schedule. The three-year programme of refit work on the nuclear submarine HMS Tireless is well ahead and the team expects to flood her up four weeks early in 1998. The quality of the Royal Dockyard work is also high, with the DML team responsible for the recent refit work on HMS Turbulent, praised by both the MOD and the boat's commander for its quality of work. An adequate quantity of surface fleet work is of vital importance to maintaining the viability of the dockyard workforce, which will have responsibility for the maintenance of the Trident fleet. The company and the workforce hope they will win the contract for Type 23 destroyer HMS Argyle, which is due for refit in May 1998. There are some very serious concerns that failure to secure the bid may affect the permanent workforce at Devonport Dockyard. I know my right honourable friend will treat all bids fairly and consider value for money and the future strategic value of Devonport Dockyard when examining bids. 
the £339 million operation to create the world's best facilities to refit and refuel Britain's nuclear submarines is now well underway. It is an alliance between six international companies committed to build the engineering base for submarine into the millennium and beyond. DML, Brown and Root, Rolls-Royce, Draken and Henshaw, the Babti Group and BNFL. Each of the Vanguard fleet of four submarines, the Victorious, the Vigilance, the Vengeance and the Vanguard, itself has 44 miles of pipework and 300 miles of cabling. Each boat will need skilled refuelling and refitting, which will be the Plymouth Royal Dockyard's critical future contribution to maintaining a British minimum deterrent into the next millennium. The skills required to do this work are of the highest order, and I know that they will not be found wanting amongst the workforce of the Royal Dockyard. Cradle of the Commonwealth, springboard of the new world, defender of the peace in the next millennium, the city of Plymouth has a proud heritage, a challenging future. As I join my neighbouring colleague, the Honourable Member for Devonport, in representing the city of Plymouth, I look forward to rising to my part in meeting that challenge. Yeah. 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 After many years, our party has been given the trust and responsibility of government. The people of Plymouth lent us their trust on the 1st of May 1997, I aim to play my part in retaining that trust. May I commend my constituency's honourable track record in the defence of the country over the whole of the past millennium and invite my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, to take full account of it as he carries out his very serious responsibilities in the conduct of our strategic defence review. Yeah. 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 Mr Julian Brazier.